good. Oops. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. My name is Gina Perrill, and I'm the Chief Strategy and Public Affairs Officer here at the Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the conversation tonight. Many of you have joined us previously, perhaps for a daytime program or a tour, and also you might have come to one of our evening programs, so I say thank you for coming again. And for those of you who might be coming here for the first time, I would be remiss if I did not invite you to come back during the day to take in some of our interactive exhibits and some of our daytime programs. Since opening a year and a half ago, we have hosted more than 20,000 students from 200 schools across the Commonwealth. Through our Senate Immersion Program module, students become senator for the day. They learn about the legislative process here and they learn about compromise, teamwork, and negotiation. And we offer these programs to students in Massachusetts at no cost. So I would also be remiss to not say to the educators in the room, please think about bringing your students for a SIM program, a Senate Immersion Module program next year. It's really remarkable and inspiring to see the students in the SIM program. With their fellow classmates, they stand up in this Senate chamber replica and they passionately and civilly discuss real legislation. And all of us who work and intern and volunteer here, we want the Institute to be a place for debate and discussion. We want to talk about important policy issues and important moments in history. And tonight's conversation is no different. This is a place where people can come and experience democracy and find common ground. And so we're very grateful that you're here tonight. We're also grateful to have this evening's panelists. These are leaders and experts from our community who are coming together to give us a deeper understanding of the issue we're discussing tonight. And we're all going to be facing the voting booth in just 12 days, and perhaps sooner for those of us who might be taking advantage of early voting. So I want to just say thank you to the team at WGBH for collaborating with us on this whole series of conversations. We could not have a better partner in shaping these conversations. So now I'd like to hand things over to our moderator this evening, Jim Browdy, host of WGBH's Greater Boston and co-host of Boston Public Radio. Jim. Thank you. Hello, Good evening, everyone. Is the mic working? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Good evening, everybody. You all want to sit at your assigned whatever's here? By the way, I will not be checking my text messages during this thing. I am going to be checking time from time to time. I am thrilled to be here uh, again. One, because I totally love this place. And two, I'm thrilled to be here because I'm really glad to be able to say to those who think people like us don't have enough sense to come out of the rain, we actually do. So uh, welcome to uh, everybody. Along with choosing a president, uh, and I was going to say November 8th, but it's true, either now or up through November 4th or then again on November 8th, and whether to legalize recreational marijuana, which we also debated here a few weeks ago, obviously there's going to be a decision on question two about whether or not to allow the expansion of charter schools. Oh, oh, so it wasn't working before. So hi, I'm Jim Browdy, and, <laughs> and I'm thrilled. No, we, I think you heard most of that uh, before. Charter schools were authorized under the Education Reform Act of 1993, considered independent public schools, and operated under five-year charters granted by the state. There are currently 78 of them in Massachusetts, serving about 40,000 students. That's about 4% of all kids. Another 30,000 children are on the waiting list, even though I have a feeling some of our panelists may dispute that number, but not by that much. A yes vote on two would allow for an increase in charter school enrollment, either by creating as many as 12 new charter schools a year or expanding enrollment in existing schools. The total number of new enrollees could not exceed 1% of the state's total public school enrollment. And needless to say, a no vote 
would leave things exactly as they are. I would say before I introduce the panelists, this could not be a more perfect night to be doing this. One, because as Gina said, a 12 days until this long national nightmare is over, this election season, I don't mean this ballot question, I mean the other thing. And two, I don't know if people have seen uh, the latest polling, which came out about an hour before I got here today. While uh, the yes side has been trailing narrowly in the last poll or two, poll came out this afternoon, and I don't know if you all know, 45 to 45. It is an absolute dead heat, and so forums like this and people like this are going to help, hopefully, uh, uh, educate the public about what the right decision for the future, not just the kids in the Commonwealth, but the Commonwealth itself is. So let me tell you quickly who the debaters are. You have much more information. I'm going to give a short version of this thing. And my apologies if I leave out something that matters to them. They can say it later. Marty Walls, sitting on the end there, represented the 8th Suffolk District, otherwise known as Boston. She was a state rep for eight years, left the state house for the top job at Planned Parenthood of Massachusetts, spent part of her early career at the Boston Public Schools and with a nonprofit working with children. She now runs her own public affairs firm, represents great schools of Massachusetts, the organization behind the Yes on Two campaign. That is Marty. Uh, Michael Curry is sitting next to her. Served as president of the Boston NAACP since 2011, recently elected to the NAACP's National Board of Directors, and just this month took over the position of chair of the Political Action and Legislation Committee from Moral Monday's legendary founder, we well, talk about big shoes, my friend, Reverend William Barber. Uh, he is obviously urging people to vote no. Jessica Tang, I'm skipping you for a minute if you don't mind, because she's next on my list. Jessica Tang spent eight years teaching Boston public school kids history and social studies, now director of organizing at the Boston Teachers Union, helped create the Community Advisory Board, giving parents, teachers, students, and community members a platform for constructive dialogue. Uh, Tang and the union she represents oppose this question. Now, Chris Gabrielli, entrepreneur started out in technology and biotech, then dipped his toes in politics with several runs office, look at that smile, including a bid for the governorship, but his heart is in education reform. Chris, the co-author of Time to Learn, How a New School Schedule is Making Smarter Kids, Happier Parents, and Safer Neighborhoods. He's chair of the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education, lectures at Harvard's Graduate School of Education, co-founder and CEO of Empower Schools, which bills itself as a third choice in the battle between public and charter schools. He is here tonight as an individual, not representing his organization urging a yes. So those are the panels. Here are the rules. The rules are essentially that there are no rules, except one, no filibuster, no bloviation, no endless kinds of things. We have a lot of topics we got to cover, and I want to do that. Many questions, I should say. In fact, I would say more than half of what I'm going to ask these people tonight or bring up came from very thoughtful ones submitted by those of you who are here tonight in advance of the forum. And finally, we're going to start tonight not in a traditional way, meaning not with opening statements. We're going to start it in a way that some very high-profile debates have sadly not started lately. I would ask each of you to look to your right or your left, extend your hand to the person sitting next to you, and shake it. Can we hear it for the four panelists, please? I'm a big fan of civility, which we have not seen much of in the last uh, couple of months. Let's start debating what I think is at the center of this debate, one of a number of issues, namely money. Uh, proponents cite a study from the Mass Taxpayers Foundation saying that this ballot question were it to pass would drain no funding from traditional public schools. Some people on the no side, Marty Walsh is one example, the mayor said it would wreak financial havoc in Boston. Elizabeth Warren, who's also a no voter, said it could hurt kids in districts with tight budgets where every dime matters. Who's right and why? Starting with you, Marty to nine cities in the entire state. Those nine cities are the ones that are at the cap today. There's 342 other cities and towns where the cap has not been reached, and so the ballot question would have no practical impact on them. So when we think about the financial impact, we want to think about those nine communities only. And the most important thing to remember is that the money follows the child. So public taxpayer dollars are associated with each child. They don't belong to a school district. They're provided to educate children whatever public school those children go to. So 4% of kids are in charter schools today of all those who attend public school. And 4% of the money spent on public education 
pays for charter schools. So just was when a child goes to evoke tech school or their school choice or they're in the Medco program, funding follows the child to whatever school. So the rhetoric is very heated about this, but in reality, charter schools are very similar to every other kind of school choice that we have in the state. Taxpayer dollars associated with a child's education go to whatever public school is educating that child. So uh, to get to the middle of that, there is no drain on funding for traditional public schools, according to you. I believe that the money that we as taxpayers spend for children's education go with the child to whatever public school they go to. This is not money that's intended to be sent from the state to school districts. The school districts don't control the state money. The state decides where the money goes because this time. is state funding. Is there funding. a drain on funding for traditional public schools if this were to pass? No, that's no. what I'm saying. It Jessica, doesn't... Michael, you want to respond to that? Hold your mic up, if you will. Uh, Jessica, uh, sure. That's just not true. And this is uh, one of the reasons I'm so frustrated sometimes right now because the debate has to be about honest facts. And the truth is, it, even the Mass Taxpayers Association report itself, which, by the way, you have to look at the funding. Who is funding these reports and in what interests are they trying to influence. And the report itself says they do not look at the district impact right in the report itself. That. And that's where the problem is, because although the funding may 4% may go to 4% uh, of the students and are in charter schools and the funding may the f maybe 4% at the state level, at the district level, that does not account for the losses. So for example, in this state, $450 million reported by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, it that's the number that's reported that's lost to district public schools. In Boston public schools, we're losing even more, like 50, 40 million just alone. And the district costs are fixed costs oftentimes. And so the analogy we like to use is that if you have a family of four, one of them goes to college, you still have to pay the mortgage, you still have to pay the electricity, the heating, et cetera. And so there are transition costs that are not accounted for in this report, and that is why over 200 school committees have passed resolutions to oppose this resolution, and so has the Boston City Council, the mayor, and uh, the Boston School Committee. Michael, we know it will. You, I'm sorry, Michael Kerr. You know what's interesting is I think as you reference what's happening nationally is that people get into these arguments and they argue the extremes to try to win the middle. And the reality is, is when you have really smart people who run cities and towns tell you that there's a fiscal impact, there's a fiscal impact. Um, in fact, the mayor of Boston is charter expansion friendly. Uh, and supported legislation to expand it. So if he comes out and tells you that there's an impact on the budget in Boston, and you're talking about structural issues that already exist within our systems, and that this exacerbates that. So I think when you go across the Commonwealth, 30 plus mayors, uh, school committees, this mayor in Boston, I think we gotta stop and listen. One important thing about this is that ballot questions are blunt instruments. As many of us who've worked on ballot questions know, they're not the right vehicle sometimes to get smart, uh, effective legislation done. This is a great example of that. Can Chris, I, you I, wanted, I, know, I yeah, want to jump in for a second because we've talked about all these school committees that are recommending a no vote. Nine communities are going to be affected by this ballot question. The vast majority of school committees that have voted to recommend a no vote represent communities in the suburbs that will not be affected by this and are 80 to 99% white. I want to get so, to the and so, No, 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 hold on, let me finish, because this is incredibly important. Most of the kids who go to charter schools in our cities are black and Latino and low income and are often immigrants. And those are the families who have their children on wait lists. So why- Marty, if I may, uh, we're gonna get to that. The goal, here, with all due respect- to understand the goal, that there's an important race- Excuse me. And, 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 gen, and issues here around family income that- Okay, we, my we goal, if I may, to all four of you, is to try to take an issue and dispose of it as best we can. We're gonna get to virtually everything. Let's stay on money for a minute. Uh, is Charlie Baker your boss? Can we consider him your boss? <laughs> I guess we sort of can. Charlie my, wa Baker, my wife's here. <laughs> Charlie Baker, She's pretty smart guy, yeah. uh, is not concerned about the funding. Marty Walsh, pretty smart guy, says he's deeply concerned. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren represents the whole state, not just those nine communities. She's deeply concerned. How is somebody at home supposed to sort through the difference of opinion here, which is pretty central, whether or not it's going to have a negative impact on your traditional public school or not? How do they find out where the truth lies? So... Um, in the work I do that focuses on this kind of third way, I manage right now as the chair of the board and through my organization's active work, a set of 
Now, 10 schools in Springfield, Massachusetts, all district public schools, 6,000 students. The state of Massachusetts has approved a charter at the middle school level. We have middle schools and high schools that will open this fall, coming fall. It will absolutely move money out of our zone of schools into those schools, and it's going to be a challenge for us to make adjustments. Now, all of our schools have the same autonomies basically as charters, plus a union agreement. And you know what? We're going to make those adjustments. And more importantly, you know what? That's a district that wants to race to the, to the top, to use a term that's in disrepute, to fight to have the kind of educational alternative that will make it damn hard for the charters to succeed. We've got two former charter principals running district schools. I'm pretty confident that we're going to convince a lot of families that our schools are going to do the good job. But if they don't, I personally don't feel like we should stop parents who think that their kid could get a better education somewhere else. I think it's up to us to raise our game, not to say just because you can't afford to move Long Meadow as the town right next door, uh -huh. if you could, you'd move there in Springfield on average. Well, I think folks who are stuck in Springfield need friends who want to work to make all the schools strong. Chris, I want to ask you, when you use the word adjustment, I don't know if that's a euphemism, for money has to be moved from other parts of the budget to fill a hole created, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. So we'll, you're saying there are, the reason, if it is true that there are not losses in traditional public schools is because money is being taken out of other pieces of the city or town budget to plug those holes. Is that what you're saying? I can't speak to other cities, but I could say, say within our little zone of, you know, $70 million, not a tiny amount, yeah, we're going to, if we, if we lose 100 students in the first year, it's a 300 school targeted thing, we will lose a million dollars of the 70, okay. okay, but we have plenty of ways we can adjust to that. We will make those adjustments. I'm not surprised. I mean, look, I spent my first career in business. If customers walk out the door, really, I've never been in any business where you get to keep the money. So, you know, my view is it's our job to, number one, make those adjustments. Number two, to focus on why, does it why is it assumed by people that if parents could, they would leave? I plan to compete. I would love to put that charter out of business. I'd like to see them deal with students moving back. That's what our job is. And I love that Springfield is fighting the fight by partnering with us to create the same autonomies that So just schools. if I can resolve this, so you're not saying that Walsh and Warren are wrong. You're just saying if they're creative, or people like Walsh, forget Warren, they can work within their budgets to essentially move money to assure that the traditional public schools don't suffer, take it out of something else. I would say that, and I would say you got to be able to say compete with people. If they have a longer got school it. day, we need to have got a it. longer school day. Can we I, can't if say I, if, to I wanna, less you for more. To one, one second, Marty, if I can. Uh, uh, Chris raises an issue. I have seen some of those lotteries, and I have to say some of the most painful things I've ever seen is a mother who is literally praying that she gets her kid gets picked to go to a charter school. Talk to that mother who doesn't make the cut and doesn't make the cut again. Why should she not be able to send her kid to a, a public school, whether it's a charter or traditional school, of her choosing, like somebody who's got a ton of dough can do, Jessica? Right. So, you know, every parent wants to make the best decision for their own child, right? Um, and when we talk about wait lists, what we don't talk about sometimes, actually, is that Boston Public Schools has twice as many students, over 21,000 students, who are on Boston Public Schools waiting lists. And if you look at the charter to school waiting... To get to waiting, prefer, into preferred traditional public exactly. schools. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we think about choice, we have to think about everybody's choice. And there are twice as many Boston families that are actually choosing Boston public schools as their priority and where they would like to send their children. And so everybody, at the end of the day, I think, wants the best for their child. And we forget that the choice of all the parents who are looking at the Boston public schools as their best choice matter as well. And that's not to say we can't improve all schools. We need to. But when we have less and less funding every year in Boston public schools that lead to more and more cuts of art teachers, librarians, uh -huh. we don't even have a nurse in every school, then that makes it harder for us to improve the quality when we have less and less funding to do Michael, so. Michael, what do you so say to that parent? You know, it's funny. Um, I have this conversation all the time. And I've visited many a charter school and been invited as a guest speaker and talk about civil rights and social justice. Uh, and I'm always a little offended when people don't recognize this is the NAACP, 107 years doing civil rights advocacy for communities of color. Uh, and really smart people sit in the room to figure out what, how the impact, this stuff will impact our communities across the country. So I'm a little offended when people don't understand that we're here and have always been here doing this work. I don't really have that conversation in a way that's offensive to the parent. I say, I understand it. My mother, I grew up in the inner city in uh, housing projects, went to really bad schools and had an opportunity to go to an exam school. 
Uh, and that was the first time I'd sat in classes that I had an opportunity to achieve and excel. But what I did learn at that exam school is that there were many people equally or smarter than me that didn't have that opportunity. And that the reality is a massive amount of our, our children, particularly children of color, will be educated in traditional public schools. That we need to put that amount of focus on improving the rigor, the quality of those traditional schools, and not abandon public education. That's the history of the NAACP is a champion for public education. Marty, that hasn't changed in this debate. Marty, you were the first person that raised the issue of race. So why don't you respond to what Michael had to so say? I totally agree that we need to be champions for our district schools. I have worked for Boston Public Schools. I've spent an awful lot of my career working to improve district schools and a total believer in the urgency of that. I don't think anybody is suggesting that that work isn't of urgent importance. When more than half of all Boston Public Schools are ranked as underperforming or chronically underperforming by the state, we know how urgent that work is. No one's disputing the work that we need to do inside these school districts. But what we are hearing is from families who want alternatives. You asked, Jim, about what to say to the mom whose child doesn't get into the charter school. And we haven't heard an answer to that other than you may have to go to a very poor performing district school. The wait lists at BPS are for the schools that are excellent. There are pockets of excellence in Boston Public Schools. The problem is there's not enough seats for the kids who want to go to school there. And so families who don't get into these great schools in BPS end up in the majority of schools that are very poor performing. And it's those families that just want a great school for their child. And there's a reason why 60% of all kids who go to charter schools in Boston are African American. And it is, we need to do better by all kids in every public school, but there's an awful lot of kids who we are leaving behind and have left behind for generations in Boston. And we have to own up to that and confront it and say to parents, we're gonna give you choices for better schools yeah. while we improve the district schools, which is of a moral imperative. Before I get to Chris, because I know you want to speak, Michael, I have looked at uh, uh, polling numbers uh, through this whole cycle. And in most of the polls, uh, people of color actually support charter schools, and white suburban families don't support charter schools. Is that, what does that do for you? Um, one, I've not yet and I'm 48 to meet anyone who's ever been polled as an African-American or Latino. So we always question polls because we never feel like we're incorporated. However, uh, I'm not gonna say they're rigged. <laughs> However, what I think is interesting to me is that there's a history of this in communities of color where we're dealing with some real serious issues, whether it's crime, edu quality education, and sometimes we're taking the first train out of the station that we have not fully understood the impact it'll have. I always use the crime bill the Clinton crime bill, as a great example. Drugs and crime in our neighborhoods, lock them up, incarcerate them. And we learned later on that that was not the right solution, that people should have sat at the table and come up with the right solutions to address that problem. To me, education, and particularly this expansion of charter school has the same impact. We need to understand the discipline issues. We need to understand the skimming issues, as I call the adverse selection issues. There's a host of issues we gotta figure out, and they're not all performing. And that they, when I go to charter schools and I walk around the building and it's all white, predominantly females, and I think all the struggles we've been going through with BPS to get diversity, right? The Garrity decision, which we brought. And yet we don't have that kind of traction in charter schools where they don't even get it that they need that diversity in front of the classroom. So we have a challenge. I think that part of the work for the NAACP is to educate our communities so that they know how to vote on these things. Let's take it back to the legislature and do it the right way. Chris, you want to, uh, you want to say something on this, or am I, yes? Are we still on money? Uh, well, if you want to. I would like to resolve, uh, not resolve. Does anybody have another comment on the issues about racial impacts here? Anybody? You don't feel the compulsion. I, I think in the end, the people who we need to listen to are parents. And they know what's best for their children. And there are parents and, at NAACP. 2,000 of no, them no, no, Michael, I'm voted not, in a moratorium. I know, I know that. I'm, so I'm saying we need to listen to parents if they're in the NAACP. And we need to listen to parents whose kids go to charter schools. And the parents of kids on wait lists. And the parents of kids who go to BPS. So let's talk about parents. So I am, I'm, okay. I'm of the view that we need to respect parents' choices. And when parents see a charter school that they want to send their child to, they sh we should respect that okay, choice and lift them parents. up. 
So I asked you about the parent who wants to get their kid into a charter school. Now I'm the parent of one of the kids who is in the 94, 95, 96 percent of schools, even if this were to pass, who's in a traditional public school. Let me start with you. Okay, uh, this passes on November 8th. We add up to 12 additional charter schools. My kid's not going to a charter school. He or she is going to a traditional public school. How's this helping me? Well, again, I'm, I'm going to stick with what I'm doing and answering that question. Okay, you, the reason I want to come back to money is Boston spends a lot more per student than Lawrence. Lawrence's students just passed Boston in proficiency in math in five years. Poorest district in the state, very high uh, ELL population, right? They're spending the money better because the educators in the individual buildings are making the choices. That is not a place any charter wants to go. They're not at the cap. They don't want to go there because they can't compete with Jeff Riley with a system where individual educators in buildings are deciding where it goes. So, you know, the, the argument that it's about more money misses the main difference with charters. It's not that they get more money or less money. They have much, far more flexibilities and they've come up with a so bunch of things. So let's put money aside for well, a second. But I, I think Tell it's really how, important to hit that, right? I'm not you know, dismissing it at all, Chris. Yeah. But so, okay, putting money aside for a second, tell me how that traditional school, how did they benefit from the excellence of the charter school in Lawrence you're talking about. Sure, like, no, these are not charter schools in Lawrence, right? This is district oh, okay. schools. This is my point. Charter so in, schools. So in charter school. All right, How so in Springfield, I meet with parents, and here's what I tell them. Our schools run the hours that kids need. They all have expanded schedules. I tell them, meet two principals, you know, uh, who have, were in the charter world, who've moved to Springfield, one from New York, one from Boston, from Lynn, to run district schools with unionized teachers taking every student from that neighborhood. There's no choice in uh -huh. Lawrence, okay? I'm Springfield. And I tell them, you know what? Here's the improvements we're taking towards teaching. Here's how we're hiring. We hired the, a record number, far more than the district had been hiring, of diverse teachers this year. We hired them all by July. They used to hire them in, we hired them all by May, at the end of May. They used to hire them, they had a lot of empty spaces in September. Now, whose fault is that? That's a management failure. That's a system failure. But if I'm a parent and I'm sending my kid to a school where the, the charter hired all their people in March, and this school has, uh -huh. doesn't even have teachers, I don't know who I should be mad at, but I should say, when is the system going to change to pick up the obvious changes we need so those schools can compete? How about that? So, Chris? you know what's interesting is there's this prevailing narrative sometimes that Boston Public Schools is a failing district, and that's just not true. There's actually more level ones and two schools than level three schools in our district. And also, when people say that we're stifling innovation, that's just not true either. In fact, a third of our schools in Boston Public Schools are uh, autonomous schools have autonomies either through in innovation schools, turnaround, pilot, or in district charters. And I want to clarify too that oftentimes those of us who are strongly opposed to question two and are seen as anti charter, that's just not true either. You know, the Boston Teachers Union proudly represents several schools where the charter schools uh, where we have teachers. Uh, for example, the um, Boston Day and Evening Academy, the um, Dudley Street Neighborhood House Charter School, etc. So this is not about being anti charter, but the in-district charter schools don't take away funding from the district public schools. And that is what the heart of this issue is, is that there is money. The current way that the system is set up, one has to come at the expense of the other. Twelve new schools, where are this funding for those 12 schools going to come from? So, We're you, already you under, we are on, already please, underfunding in the Foundation Budget Review Commission in this state found that we are underfunding all of our public schools by over a billion dollars. So this would exacerbate that greatly. Review on that one. Let's just hold that. I want you to respond to the same question I asked Chris Marty. If you exactly would. what I was trying to get to is the things that charter schools are doing that can help improve districts. And then we have a couple of examples that are very worth important mentioning. That longer school day. Charters have a much longer school day than traditional district schools, and district schools have begun to adopt that best practice. Charter schools also have more autonomy in hiring. The chair of the Boston School Committee recently agreed that some of the changes being made in Boston around autonomy and hiring are because of what they saw in charter schools. Uh, there's another charter school uh, out in the Groton area that has a capstone project for its seniors. The local district has now adopted that practice because it saw how well it was working in the charter schools. So there are myriad examples of where things that are working in the charter schools are then adopted by the district. And that's part of why we have charter schools existing is to be able to test out those ideas and allow districts that are open to change to bring them back. I mean, charter schools can't force districts to change, but where districts are open to it, like a Springfield district, for example, 
there's great benefits that, that when those changes are brought back to the district. Uh, so, Michael, are you satisfied that in Boston, for example, what the good the charters are doing is being replicated in some of the Boston public schools? So I, and it's interesting because of course, what she just said, um, the innovation, the, the um, and, and I've been to some, some schools that are charter that use call and response, and we've been talking about a cultural competence in some of these schools. Uh, and if those innovations, those things are coming to traditional public schools, that's great, but that was the genesis behind all of this, right? Is to have charter schools that experimented and brought that in to where over 90% of our kids are and to make sure that those things work. It wasn't to replace, it wasn't to compete with. And the reality is I find it, it, I find it cowardly by policymakers who are walking away from our traditional public school system and looking for the next alternative. Metco, great, few students that go, uh, the exam schools, now there's a next new thing. The reality is most of our kids will be educated and get their opportunities through these traditional public schools and how dare us not raise the bar for the rest of these kids. And the way to do that is wherever the innovations come, let's bring them back to traditional public schools, let's not abandon where most of our kids will attend. You know, one of you mentioned accountability a minute ago and the questions that were submitted in advance, money was number one, issues about race were number two. I didn't literally count the numbers, but it was pretty close. Number three was accountability. And starting with you, Marty, because I know you think local control is a problem rather than an asset, you've said on more than one occasion. Uh, the term taxation without representation was in three questions submitted by either people who are here or people who intended to come here. Why is local control a bad thing for public schools? And it's not always a bad thing. You're painting with a broad brush. But I'm reading we, your quote. No, no, I'm but I'm it. saying local control brought us some of the challenges that we are trying to address with charter schools. The charter schools were created in 1993 specifically by the legislature so that charter schools were created by the state so that families who were not being well served by their local school committees had an opportunity to attend the same kind of great schools that parents and other communities could attend. But I want to pause. We're here in the replica of the U.S. Senate chamber. And I'm just amazed that we're having a debate about local control when Senator Kennedy would often fight against local control, whether it was around the Fair Housing Act or the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act or the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Senator Kennedy understood that disadvantaged kids and dispossessed people are often hurt by local control and that sometimes a state government or a federal government needs to step in and provide things that local people don't want to provide to those who don't have political power or those who don't have the resources to fight. So local control is not always a good thing. It can be. It's not an unalloyed bad. It's not an unalloyed good. But we need to think But it is hard. unalloyed missing from charter schools, whether it's sometimes and good, because, sometimes bad. Because there is no because charter local schools control. are serving the needs of families that are not being well served. I'm not by their local with you. I just want to understand the facts. The facts That's, are there is not local control. Exactly. And is because, that a problem? because this, and the history, so there is accountability it. at the state level. This is not taxation without representation. We all get to vote for state representatives, state senators, and governor. There's a lot of representation. Folks are on the ballot on November 8th and the governor's on the ballot in two years. There's an awful lot of representation. It's just at the state level, not the school committee level. Fair enough, how about it, Jessica? So I'm gonna give a ex concrete example of how this is an important issue. In Brockton, every single elected representative went to the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, which, by the way, is the only body in this state that can approve of new charter schools. And they said, we don't want a new charter school there. The mayor, the school committee, the city council, parents, teachers, students all said, we do not want a new charter school there. We have improved significantly. People are happy with the public schools there. The board approved of one anyway. This fall, it was supposed to open. They did not pull the proper permits. They did not get the school building built in time. And now the Brockton taxpayers have to pay for transportation to Norwood, almost 20 miles away, every single day for the students who were not able to go to a school that was approved by the board and that was opposed by every elected official that was democratically elected um, in Brockton. Chris or Marty, you want to respond? The, to what about the parents? We're talking local control as if the school committees are the be all and end all and know what's best for families. The whole point of charter schools is they don't always get it right to meet the needs of every child. And so there's clearly an interest in Brockton 
for an alternative to what Brockton's offering those families. And yes, there was a problem with the permit. We don't need to, the details are complicated, but what we do know is that there's demand by families in Brockton for different and better schools, and we need to listen to those families. They're telling us something. Chris. I mean, I wanted, I wanted to go back on one point, and I know we're not supposed to go back, but I do want to <laughs> say, Jessica, look, I like the ideas, you know, when you say a third of the schools in Boston are autonomous. I have spent 15 years of my life fighting to expand learning time for kids. I've worked with the Boston Teachers Union, Boston Public Schools, Senator Kennedy wrote federal legislation with us, visited the Edwards Middle School to talk about it. None of those schools you're talking about have an expanded learning day. And, you know, when, when Tom Birmingham and... and, and uh, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Which schools don't have it? Uh, innovation schools have expanded learning days? Some of Pilot them, schools? Yes, no, yes, they do. Not, they, yes, they do. Oh, yes, please, please. check okay. on the Boston Public Schools right. website. And here's the crazy thing. I don't know much about Here's the crazy thing, though, Chris, right. is that we had extended learning time before the charter schools did, yeah, you're too. Right. Look the at penalty the, school, uh, right. dating to 1987. And we, and we still don't have expanded learning time for Jessica, the kids who need and want it. Jessica, let them finish the thought, and then you can respond. Jessica, at some point, we got to be honest. Many of the people who are supporting charters are fed up with waiting for adults in the system, and I think it's as much about management and leadership and local control as anything else, and agreements that get in the way. But in the bottom line is, I understand why people say, how come my kid goes to school and gets out in Boston public middle schools at 1.30 p.m.? What is the idea behind that? Who is this good for, the working parents? Is it good for the kids? The teachers don't want it. You know that. The teachers are in majority in favor, and I understand they should get paid more. I fight for that. But at some point, it's reasonable for some people to say, enough with that BS. A fierce urgency of now imp compels us to say, what do we do about it? And I'm with you. I want to fight to change the system. For, but I want to be honest here. This charter fight is a toxic distraction from the reality that the pace of change that the people who wrote the 1993 Act envisaged when Roosevelt and Birmingham wrote their piece, their point was in 1993, when we got to large-scale funding and clear goals for kids, nobody envisaged how slow and disappointing change would be for our neediest kids. Can we stay on longer school? I, I mean, I, I don't want to get... Wait, 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 if I may. I, it's yeah. not that useful to say, he, you know, you're a puppet, you're a puppet, you're whatever it is. Uh, it, I, I don't want to get into that because we're never going to resolve the facts. What I do want to get into, one of the few commonalities that I've experienced from pro and anti-question two people is almost everybody who calls our radio show wants a longer school day. So how do we deal with that fact? It was supposed to happen in Boston. It's right. happened in itty bitty numbers. Right. So how do we break so that law jam? So what I'm a little confused about is that we have agreed to expand learning time in all of our K to eight schools. And in fact, we were supposed to roll it out this year, but it's funding. In order to expand learning time, we need to have funding to do it, yet we're losing millions of dollars every year to the charter schools. And again, we're not blaming the charter schools, but the way the system is set up, one does come at the expense of the other. This year, the state only reimbursed 63% of the transition costs that we were supposed to be given. That's, nine, that's actually across the state, $47.1 million. In Boston alone, that's $19 million. That could have helped us roll out our extended learning time. Well, you know, I want to go to you, Chris, because yeah. you're the one who's been candid enough to say, of course, you got to pay teachers more to do this. And uh, I, I, I think that's an admirable thing. In my opinion, I'm not supposed to have one here, the legislature embarrassed itself by not resolving this issue and letting it go to the voters where they have to confront. That's their job, in my estimation. How about this issue? They pass a mandate, essentially, which is not atypical for a legislative body, and then they don't fund the whole thing. So what are the, what are the Jessicas of the world and others who have her position and say, we'd love to do these reforms, We'd love to emulate some of the things that charter schools do. Unfortunately, the state talks out of one side of its mouth and then doesn't fund what they're telling you to do. How do you respond to that? They should be fully funding the commitments they made. I couldn't agree more. The, uh, let's be clear on expanded learning time. In Lawrence, Massachusetts, where the American Federation of Teachers local voted for the contract 55 to 45, all the kids are going not 40 minutes at a handful of schools. They're going two to three hours a day more. That's why they're doing better. That's why the parents are coming back. That's why Lawrence is growing its population of students. It, the only way that happened was when the state put its thumb on the scale because the local control group and the local leadership, all the folks involved had gotten whatever set of things you want to get into, they weren't making progress on it. I would love to see, I would love to see Boston embrace that. I, you know, the teachers are getting paid $5,000 a year or more. It's not hourly. 
It's quite a meaningful amount more. Same deal in Springfield. We got a 92 to 8 percent vote of the Massachusetts Teachers Association local for it. I believe that we can have common ground on this. And where's the money come from, by the way? Not extra money. It comes from taking most of the money out of central office. We spend a ridiculous amount of money in this state, in this country, at central offices. 65 cents on the dollar is the estimate of what makes it to school classrooms. If we were spending 85 cents like we do in Springfield, we'd have room for all of those things. Chris, so you've told we just need deeper reforms you've than told people a few are being honest about. about collaborative work between all the stakeholders in a couple of cities. Uh, it's local people making local collaboration happen. Uh, where it doesn't happen, does it concern you? Two of your colleagues have commented. Does the lack of local control concern you? Jessica is concerned. Marty is not. Are you? So I believe we need to have local voices. I think it's really crucial. So in Springfield, mean? the board is four people appointed by the state, three people uh, local, the mayor, the superintendent, and the uh, vice chair of the school board. Uh, the teachers union was a signatory to starting the whole thing. So there's plenty of local voice involved. Wouldn't have happened if the state hadn't said, if you don't do that, we're going to take deeper action because these schools have languished for too long. But I think it's very important to have that local voice. I'm a big supporter of it. it teaching all the kids and having local voice is a crucial, are crucial benefits the district schools bring. I think you've got to embrace that. But again, I personally, I'm 56 years old. I'm tired of waiting 20 more years for people who have the power to get off their butts and make the changes that are needed for these kids. Michael Curry, local control, uh, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately, and, and Marty made a point about, you know, you elect people, you appoint people, you advance people to, to represent your interests. And that happens on a local level, too. You know, we put people in positions to represent our interests and to know our local needs. I think what concerns me, even uh, as Chris made his comment, is this, that I'm, it shouldn't be this difficult, that the reality is that I see a lot of money coming into Massachusetts right now on this issue. I see a lot of faces who've not fought for black and brown children before that I didn't see here when we were fighting on all these other issues. That all of a sudden now they care about black and brown children and now there's a lot of money coming out of nowhere to build charter schools and invest all this money. Where were they before? So to me, this is concerning because the reality is we could have had all this coalition effort to get the state funding that we need to run quality, high-performing, public, traditional public schools, and we didn't do that. So when you say that you're tired of it, you're fed up, and you're tired of waiting, I'm like, well, where you, you know, we should get together because the, the real fight is on the traditional public education side. That's where we need to get together, put our money, our resources. I don't, I don't know, all this out-of-town money coming in, I wish they'd divert that money to the real fight. So How about me, addressing that issue? No, it's been a big on. issue. I, I want to address this issue of Boston Public Schools' budget keeps getting cut that Jessica has talked about and sort of blaming a lack of money for the challenges in Boston. In the last six years, Boston Public Schools' budget has gone up 25%. The charter school money does not reduce the BPS budget. And so there is more and more and more money for fewer and fewer kids because kids are leaving for charters. Boston spends more per pupil than any of the 100 largest school districts in America. And so what we need to do is look at Boston and say you've got 57,000 kids, capacity for about 90,000. The district has money that it can spend differently and put that money back in classrooms. The challenge for Boston is not charter school tuition. It's that it's got a budget that is not in line with the number of students that it's educating. And it's a, it, we have to, again, confront these so difficult Marty realities. Walsh does not know what he's talking about when he says the opposite of what you say, that well, Marty the Walsh, are draining so, millions from so the public? So Marty Walsh public? has a political problem on his hands. Um, we, everybody in elected office kind of gets what you, there's political pressure coming from special interest groups. And we just have to acknowledge that. It's the Meaning very the real union. factors that there is a teachers union support for our mayor. I get it. But what we need to talk about is not the political issues, but the on the ground reality for Boston public schools. The mayor is going to have a hard time confronting the reality that we need to close schools in Boston. We need to adjust the budget. There is excess capacity that's draining money away from the kids who can actually go to school and put that money back into the classroom. And we need to make those hard adjustments in Boston. The challenge in Boston is not charter school tuition. That does not come out of the BPS budget. So it is just incorrect to blame charter school tuition for the problems of the BPS budget. How about the, the facts money issue that Michael Curry raised, which has gotten a lot of press, the out-of-state money? So there's out-of-state money coming in on both sides of this campaign. 
So there's a, the, the vote no campaign is funded 99% by the teachers unions. 99% of the vote no money is coming from the, the two teachers unions, much of it from out of state. So why we want to talk about who's got more money coming in from out of state and where it's coming from, there's money in from out of state on both sides of this. So it's kind of not an issue that differentiates the yes and the no side here. Does it differentiate? It, it, it absolutely you? does. How we so? are being outspent two to one. The reason why you see so many misleading yes on two ads is because we can't afford to have, buy as many ads as the other side can. And the majority of the money is coming from out of the state through dark, dark money funds where we can't even trace who is funding it. Teachers unions, we know who we're funded by. Teachers, people like me, each one of us puts a little bit money into our teachers union and we're fighting this fight, not because of, not because of any philosophical whatever battle, it's because the reality is we are trying day in and day out to improve our schools, to provide a quality education for all of our students. And I do need to mention this because when we talk about funding, we're not talking about the fact that Boston Public Schools serves twice as many severe needs, special dis uh, students with disabilities, <laughs> twice as many English language learners, and we're proud that? I didn't hear that. English language twice learners. as many English yeah. language learners, and we are proud to serve those students, but they do cost more money to educate, and the, the, the current funding formula assumes that the charter schools are getting the, having the same number of those students in their schools, and they get the money, but they actually don't have the students. Chris and Marty, that is correct, is it not? What uh, Jessica just said. I don't know if the precise number is. So this, there's this narrative that charter schools don't educate children with special needs. That the data show that that is not correct. No, but the number disparity that Jessica uh, mentioned is accurate, uh, correct? No. That, that is very much correct. If you look at the data from DESE, we have, or even the Boston School Committee just did a presentation, we have twice as many students with severe disabilities, and we do have more so students with this, disabilities in general across the state, not so just what, in Boston. So charter schools have the same percentage of special needs kids as the district schools do. There is a narrative that has, I, so hold on, let, it would be helpful if folks would let me finish the answer. There is the same percentage. There are certain programs that Boston examples, for example, that charter schools don't offer. For example, there's a school for the deaf in Boston. The idea of behind charters is that if I have a child who's deaf, the school that can best meet my need is the Jackson Mann School. I get to choose to send my child there because that school best meets my child's needs. If I have a child with autism, Boston Public Schools has some amazing programs for kids with autism. I want to choose, that may be where I want to go. If my kid wants to be in the arts program, I want to go to Boston Arts Academy. But it's more the, expensive, even if all those facts are of, true. Of course what Jessica it's, said, it's obviously more expensive. How but, about English language learners? What I've read is there's a huge disparity. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% in traditional public schools, 8% so in, in charges. Is that in two, true? In 2010, when the last cap lift bill was done, that was true. So the legislature put new rules in place for charter schools. You have to have, as a charter school, a recruitment and retention plan. And you have to recruit and retain high-risk populations of students, including special needs students, English language learners, low-income kids, kids at risk of dropping out. So they are required to recruit them, and they are required to retain. And their charter renewal every five years hinges on whether or not they've met the goals in the recruitment and retention plan. So yes, there's been problems in the past I happen to be the author of that law and agreed that we needed to have more accountability for charter schools. And the legislature stepped in and put a lot more accountability in. And we've seen a very significant change in the number of English language learners and SPED students at charter schools. The law is working. It was a problem. It's been fixed. And the charter schools have stepped up. And, and we're seeing the results. What's Michael. funny is, is that she's saying this from this level, but I've met with many charter leaders who tell me that they have a challenge with special ed and ELO. So I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but you may want to get with your members, many of whom will tell me that they're still trying to fix that issue, they, that they, they realize that there's not a, 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 a comparable population of ELL and SPED within their schools. What I'm getting I'm at is that w the law has changed, the accountability measures are in place, and we're seeing the progress. Are charter schools perfect? No. Are district schools perfect? No. But what we have said to the charters in exchange for the cap lift the last time, you want to educate more kids? We need to see that your population is more representative 
of the kids in the cities where you're opening schools. And that's the kind of accountability that we put in place. And is it perfect yet? No, it's only been five, six years, but we're seeing tremendous changes and a lot of progress being made. And we should be proud that we've got that kind of accountability measure I, and I have charter to, schools well, are making more, progress. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I have to repeat something that Marty said. We had to pass a law to get charter schools to serve all students, including English language learners and students with special needs, students who have trauma, social emotional concerns, etc. We had to pass a law to even try to get them to get more of these students. We've been serving them all along in Boston Public Schools and we are proud to serve them, but we can't do it with less and less funding. That's a point I need to make. And the second point is, although some of the charter schools have increased their levels of English language learners or students with special needs, they are not the same students. Again, in Boston Public Schools, we serve twice as many of the students with special, severe special needs. We have places like the School for the Deaf and also the Carter Development Center for students with severe physical disabilities. And also the Multicultural Education Training Advocacy Group did actually an analysis of the charter schools in the East Boston area because to be fair, they do have more English language learners. But what we found is that they only serve one ELD one or two students. I'm getting a little technical here, but for teachers who know, those are the students who just come to our country and speak zero English. They only had one of each level. In Boston Public Schools, we have 30% or higher in some of our schools. In fact, at Binka, we have 85% ELD ones and twos. So even if they are taking some more, it's first of all still 12% versus 30%, but they're not even the students with the greatest needs. Jessica, earlier Marty uh, mentioned that uh, there were special interests that, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's understandable that Marty Walsh is where he is in part because of special interests. You're the special interest. No, I mean the teachers. Which, no, but I mean. I'm so, a teacher. But, no, no, I mean, no, no, I guess. No, no. I don't mean you as a teacher. I mean the teacher. I, but unions are made sides. up of teachers. But you said earlier right. ago you're not anti-charter. Right. Is the t either the teachers' unions ever supported a charter bill on Beacon Hill? Not under the current funding system. What would you support? Okay. If, if it turns out they said yeah. to you, mm -hmm. if the leaders on Beacon Hill said, and this is for you too, Michael, they said, okay, we're going to craft the bill. We're not going to. Uh, uh, we're not going to shirk our responsibility. We are going to expand the number of charters in the state. Uh, we want to tell you two of us to tell us what you'd support that accommodates your needs, but also allows us to expand. Could, is there a bill you could craft that would meet those criteria? Well, part of the problem, I think, is we are, it is still, the jury's still out on if, whether or not charter schools are better, right? And so if we don't even know it's better, why are we in a rush to expand something that we don't know that is better? first of all. And second of all, why don't we get the accountability measures in place? So far, we've been comparing apples to oranges this whole time. And so I know they're going to say, oh, there's all these independent studies. Well, first of all, they're not independent. They love to use the Stanford study. That came out of Credo. That came out of the Hoover Institute, which, surprise, surprise, is funded by the Walton Foundation, the heirs of Walmart. So these independent studies actually aren't so independent. But we're comparing apples to oranges currently. And until we level the playing field and see whether or not the innovations um, that they have are actually working, why are we talking about that when there's so many other things I'd Understood. rather be talking so the about is, to under improve public schools. You would. would you? Is there a crafter, is there a charter bill that could be crafted that would satisfy your concerns? So this goes back to my original comment that, you know, the legislative process is a deliberative process. That's where you get in a room and you figure out what works and what makes sense. We're circumventing that by doing this with the ballot question. That never, I'd say never, almost never works. That the, this requires legislators to get in a room, to hear from parents, to hear from communities, to talk about the funding issues, the discipline issues. That is not, we didn't allow that to play out. And sometimes that's not one legislative session, that's two sessions or three. And the reality is, is I'm for a conversation through the legislative process, not the legal process, which failed, uh, not the ballot question, but the state house. We can get to a solution that works. We are not, and NAACP national and local have said this, we're not anti-charter. And again, many of our members have founded charter schools across the country. What we are is for abandoning the traditional public education system. And essentially, when you hear the rhetoric of the yes on two side, that's essentially what the argument is. Public schools suck, and we want to go to charter schools. Chris, here, uh, Marty, you want to respond to that, Chris? Th that public schools suck, to quote Michael Curry, is the uh, argument. We so what I just, schools. I just said earlier, there are pockets of excellence, and that's why we see wait lists for some Boston public schools. I am a deep believer in the urgent need to improve our district schools. 
So there, I don't want this to turn into public district schools are bad, charter schools are good. This is an and strategy. The work I did in 2010 in the legislature was a bill that helped empower principals in district schools and helped bring more change to charter schools. If we don't do both, we are failing to meet the needs of kids. So there is, I get very upset and frustrated when we pit this of you're either pro-district or you're pro-charter. We need to be pro-public school. And this is an all-in strategy Martin, to meet the needs of families. When you mention frustration, should the public not be frustrated, and this is not your doing, but should the public not be frustrated that we are spending thousands of hours debating what would help maybe another 1% of the student population, and comparatively speaking, no hours discussing what would directly help 95% well, of the population. I think, I think we're all frustrated that we're here. I'm not but, assessing blame, by no, the way, no, no, but I that is what it is. Right, we're here, and so we're doing the best we can. But I think it's also important to realize the virulent opposition in, that the teachers' unions bring to the legislature when we try to do bills to make it easier to improve district schools. So the teachers' unions come in and block the bills that like would what? help improve like the what? district school. Well, the bill that we did in 2010, there was virulent union opposition to the Achievement Gap Act of 2010. What is that? Because it allowed districts to do reform from within. Now, the legislature passed it, and Governor Patrick signed it over the virulent opposition of the teachers' unions. And the teachers' unions continue to oppose bills in the legislature that would allow us to reach some of the level three schools that are poor performing before they go into turnaround status. So the teachers' unions block the bills in the legislature that allow us to do reform at the district level. And now they're complaining that we're doing a bill on the ballot about charter schools. They're blocking all of the efforts to do right by kids, whether they're in district schools or charter schools. But they didn't schools. block what you just said. They lobbied and they lost. They lost, but they did everything in their power to stop it, and they have done everything in their power to stop the bills, Michael, that we're talking about in the legislature in the last two legislative sessions. We're at this impasse because we don't have a way out right now because of the incredible opposition from the teachers' unions. And we have we to own this. To that. Let me th oh, yeah. Jessica, how about you from the Boston Teachers' Union? You know, Union? it's really frustrating because, you know, as a teacher, we are always trying to think of innovative ideas, always trying to improve our schools. And when we block something, or we're advocating against something, it's not because we're advocating for the status quo or we're advocating against innovation. It's because we are on the ground, and a lot of times policies are made at this level that have really great intentions, I truly believe, but have a lot of unintended consequences. And because those of us in the classroom and on the ground can anticipate a lot of the unintended consequences of policies that are made up here without understanding how that might actually roll out and impact what's down here, we do oppose some things sometimes, but it's not because we oppose things just to oppose things, it's because we oppose things because we know it may, not, it may actually hurt our ability to help our students and help our schools. And that's really frustrating because that's the truth, is that teachers, we are in the work in the schools every single day. We know what's going to help or hurt, and really, policies that sound really good up here, in, a, in fact, on the, in the ground level, actually can be really harmful and have unintended consequences. You're head of the Board of Higher Ed. I know we're talking charter schools. Are unions an obstacle to reform in public education in Massachusetts? No, not in public higher ed. Um, look, one thing I wanted to say, you know, you said at the beginning I was here to urge people to vote. Yes on three or two. No, I'm not. I'm voting yes myself. Okay. I'm here to hijack this debate in favor of the real changes that are really needed. I am going to vote yes on two, though. Let me just say for a second why. You know, in 1996, I was 36 years old. I was trying to learn about education. I saw a lot of really troubling things that weren't working well. And I came across a school started by a couple of young idealistic guys, one African, half African-American, half Puerto Rican named John King, and one white named Evan Ruddle. Called, schools called Roxbury Prep Charter School. Roll the film forward. This school, that school was getting extraordinary results for an entirely minority population. In fact, it ended up getting higher outcomes for kids than Weston, Wayland, and Wellesley. Not adjusted for anything, just absolute scores. No one had seen anything. There had never been a district public school in Massachusetts that had ever done this. And John King in particular, who's really become a friend over the years, 
I mean, this is a guy whose dad was a, the first black principal and, and an, or regional superintendent in New York City for his area. He died when he was young. There's public schools, including an exam school, just the same story, you know, made his life forward, right? And so, you know, I thought there were good ideas to be had from there. It's one of the weirdest places I saw that an expanded school schedule could make a big difference. And I decided to spend the next bunch of years of my life trying to help districts and other people make the changes that can help kids in the same way at large scale. So what's the moral but, of your story? Well, the moral of my story is John King has come out on this issue. I mean, Jessica, respectfully, when Democrats say that the, de there's no evidence that charter schools in Boston are performing, they're just as much science deniers as when Republicans say climate change isn't there. It's just not true. I mean, the, da the data is overwhelming that the Boston charter schools specifically not the national charter schools, that same group that you call Credo, you say is Hoover or whatever, which Linda Darling-Hammond would be surprised to find out about, who's also at Stanford, but they're the ones who have the data that often get cited that say nationally, charters on average aren't better than district schools. There are a lot of crappy charters. I, you know, I was out in Detroit recently, 80% of their charters are for-profit crappy charters. The word charter just means someone gets the chance to run a school. If they're a dip, you know what, they're gonna run a bad school. If they're a thief, they're gonna steal, of course. In Boston, these charters are doing a great job. And so when my son graduated from college with the first kid from Roxbury Prep to get into Harvard, just like John King had done, and he, he talked to me, and I met that classmate of his, about what it means to that family that they want their daughters to follow their son, to be able to go to the same school that put their kid on the path to going to Harvard College. I'm like, you know what? I will never compromise a view that I want to support parents and the chance to get to the schools they want. I'm not putting my time into that. I have not given a nickel to this campaign. I have run television ads when I ran for office saying I supported charters. Didn't turn out to be a good idea, by the way, for those of you at home thinking about running for governor. But I'd like to think it was a point of principle, right? But I work closely with unions. I've been on Randy Weingarten's national AFT board. She supports the, the uh, agreement in Lawrence, as you know. Look, I want to work with unions and where they want to be partners on this stuff. I have done more personally, I think, in the last 15 years than a lot of folks, you know, to make a difference that way, right? But I want to come back and say, we got to be four parents, and we got to be four idealistic people who build schools that work better for kids. Michael. Yeah, it, you know, what's interesting is that when we talk about what's a crappy school, right? So you talk about a school that may be performing academically, and again, I would argue that they're not all performing academically. They come in our office and make those complaints. I think the other issue is, in order for it to be a quality school, to me, you can't expel black and brown boys. You can't have a pattern of removing students to talk about how great you are and not working with our children. To me, that's the, the, the fallacy in this whole argument, is that we, we want to claim that we have great charter schools, but to the ELL argument, the SPED argument, the black and brown boys argument, in some cases girls, they are not dealing with all of our children. That's a concern for the NAACP, locally and nationally. So let's have a real conversation. It's not just about a few charter schools that are doing well. I just came from Ohio, where we just know the recent news is that there are a lot of charter school problems in Ohio. We are adamantly opposed to for-profit charters. We don't like privatiz privatization of education. That's an NAACP stance, because we've seen what privatization has done uh, across the country, particularly in communities of color, whether it's prisons or schools. So we have a, a conversation that we need to have and we need to, as, as I argue, as I say this often, we always argue extremes to, to win the middle. Let's get somewhere in the middle and have a conversation about what works, what can be applied in traditional public schools, and not have this floodgate of charter schools open that we don't even know if they will work for all of our kids. Can you speak a little bit more to the disciplinary issue? I wanted to return to it, but since you brought it up, raise the issue a little bit more and let's get some response here. So, you know, Jessica and I have just recently had this conversation about the issues that's been publicized both locally and national, Roxbury, Pratt. I mean, you go across the, the district and across the country where there is a pattern of, and again, some of this is cultural incompetence, Right, that you have schools that don't have the diversity, they're not, they don't know how to teach our kids, they're not trained to the level that our teachers are in traditional public schools. They don't have the degrees and the certifications to even know how to deal with students, and therefore, they suspend them. I'm a parent, a parent of a 13-year-old, that at one point in a traditional public school, I was getting a call once a week, and it would shock you the things that they were kicking him out of school for. So we're working in traditional public schools to make sure we stop that practice, the issue has been one that even charter advocates admit is a problem. Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and other organizations have published data that is happening. To me, that's a quality issue too. 
Because what it means is you're skimming. You're, go you're going for the students that you believe you can control in, in, in these often very tight environments, and you're kicking out kids like me who come from communities that you may not like the way we wear our pants or how we dress or how we act. Those are the people who are walking into our office, and I'd invite you to come and sit in our office, that are bringing their stories from charters. Now we got to turn our attention from traditional schools across the Commonwealth to now focus on these charters that don't seem to get it. Chris, you want to respond to that? I mean, 100% of the kids at Roxbury Prep are of color, so there's not... they're More not to the point. Well, they're not kicking out the kids of color to serve white kids or something, but here's... That wasn't the, my argument. And I don't think John King, you know, is in the education uh, to take advantage of kids of color. I don't think President Obama supports charter expansions against... The you know, oldest and so, largest civil rights organization in the country. Most of the legal cases that have been brought and won in this country in education for equity has been from this organization. We got real smart education advocates and researchers at the table too. This is a serious issue. So you can, I, we can go back and I, forth. I, I, I want to agree with you. No, I want to agree with you, by the way. There are very serious issues on, on disciplinary uh, situations in schools. It's something I'm really concerned about within the Springfield Empowerment Zone. Um, schools had been disciplining kids before we got involved, and since we've been involved, it's only our beginning of our second year, uh, far too much. They've been using suspensions far too much, a lot of challenges, but that's, n you know, I think there's real issues about driving change on that, and I agree with you entirely. That is really important. I care about arts, music, drama, sports. I mean, well, I think that's been not enough in some of the charter schools, you know, and Lawrence has been a bigger piece. I don't think charter schools are perfect. The reason I'm going to vote yes, and by the way, I want to be clear, I agree with you. This should have been dealt with by the legislature. I do not think this is the good type of thing to have on the, you know, put to the voters. But the reason I'm going to vote yes is simply because I, you know, I think some more schools of a sort that I think do have a good track record of results. And as you know, when they do the comparison results on charter results, all the students ever admitted are the ones who are compared. So when they say what happened to kids, it's not the ones who stay in the school, it's all the kids. So if they push a kid out, that's still on their track record for all those research studies that have shown these differences. Chris. My view is until we see faster change, particularly in Boston, I just can't see looking the family in the face. You know, they're just thinking of one particular family and saying you shouldn't have the choice of school you think is best for your kid just like it was for your oldest son. Uh, why do you think, I'm sorry to keep bringing it up, but we've mentioned Boston so much. Why does Marty Walsh not understand what you're saying in such a heartfelt way? He's on, been on a board of a charter school. He makes that point all the time. Uh, he is not voting yes. In fact, he wrote an op-ed urging people to vote no. What is he missing that you I think haven't? reasonable people can really disagree on this one, Jim. I really do. I mean, I think it's great that the Mayor Walsh helped get neighborhood charter schools gutted. Yeah. It's a really good, strong neighborhood-based school. He has proposed a car charter cap lift. He's into a difference on yeah. the percentage. You know, this is why it would have been better handled by the legislature. Well, can we, we talk agree, about the okay? legislature? I want to talk about the legislature for a minute. Nikki Songas, Congresswoman, was on our show today, radio show. She's voting no. And she said one of the concerns for her was uh, that this has potential to get, I'm putting words in her mouth, but the gist of it was out of control. She said, you know what they should have done? They should have sunset this provision so that people like you potentially would have said, I'm not crazy about this thing, but I can maybe breathe deeply and live with it if I know it's an experiment for a finite period of time. So my question is, while legislature's fallen all over itself to say they're going to amend the marijuana question if it passes, they haven't said a boo about this. If this were to pass and uh, there was a proposal to sunset the expansion, the cap, after X number of years, two, three, I want to start with you two, is that something you'd support, Chris, Marty? So, I don't understand the proposal. So. Sunset. Essentially, so, this expansion, this up to 12 more a year, would not be into infinity. It would be for a finite period of time, after which time the legislature would have to re-examine it, and if they chose to extend it, they'd have to vote again to extend this provision. Is that something you support? Do th I think we will see, if the ballot question passes, a lot of conversation about are there adjustments that need to be made. But I would wanna, you support that no, adjustment? But, but hold on. Let me just say this. There's this notion that we're going to get 12 schools a year ad infinitum. The, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education screens out almost all applicants for charter schools as being insufficient. They're not strong enough applications. And then there's charter schools that have closed because they're not good enough. And so the reality is we have seen very slow and steady growth over the Would years. Would you support a sunset provision? I, I, I'm going to support a conversation about potential changes to it, but what I don't want to do is come up with something today 
that cuts off good schools when families still need them. This for me is about kids and families and we need to listen to that and see how do we meet their needs for great schools, district and charter. And we see very slow, steady growth over the years on charter schools since the first ones opened in 1995. And quality has been maintained so we don't see what we see in Detroit. For me, we need to match up the need for charters with the demands by parents for better schools and let parents help decide how many charter schools we need based on the needs of their children. Would you can contemplate supporting a charter bill? We discussed this before, if it had a sunset, so even if you weren't crazy about it, you'd essentially reach out your hand to people like Marty and Chris and say, we'll try this as long as we know it's gotta be re-examined and re up if it's successful and not if it's not? So here's my challenge right now, is that I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that when voters today, right now, are faced with yes or no on the current question that they're being asked to vote on. And the current question we're being asked to vote on is do we want 12 new Commonwealth charter schools forever, every year potentially, and how would that impact the 96% mm -hmm. of students who are in public schools and who do want quality public schools but need to keep the funds in public schools in order to improve them? And I, I know that we've moved on to a, to a different kind of back. topic, we're but I do want to, yeah, we're I all, need to yeah. go back to one other sure. point, which is that uh, it was interesting to me that Roxbury Prep was the example you used because Roxbury Prep actually has the highest suspension and expulsion rates in the state. And in fact, John King, who's the Secretary of Education right now, publicly said he has serious concerns about the disciplinary policies in charter schools because there is evidence, as Michael said from the Lawyers Committee um, in Civil Rights Report, that the highest suspension and expulsion rates are all from charter schools and they're disproportionately contributing to the school to prison pipeline and the students who are pushed out of the charter schools come back to Boston public schools and district public schools across the state. And in fact, when I first started teaching, I wasn't anti-charter and I'm not anti-charter. I actually went almost taught at Roxbury Prep. Um, but the reason why I started questioning charter schools was because every year I would get the students from the charter school down the street. And oftentimes these students had a lot of special needs or were five years behind in reading level and I would do everything I could even though I had more than 30 students and my friend working at that school had 16 students. And so I was like, there's something not right here. And so that's I, why I, this is a problem. Well, one second, because so since Chris yeah. raised Roxbury, how do you respond to what Jessica just had to say about the suspension rate issue? Look, I think it's an issue, but the, that same person you're citing just publicly said we should raise the cap in Massachusetts. So, I mean, it's hard to use John King as an example why we should not do it, right, since he's made clear what his position is all in. But why do we have a cap? Let's back up, Jim. You said sunsetting expansion. Why do we have a cap? Because in 1993, no one knew what these new schools would be like. They were absolutely uh -huh. an experiment, right? Why do the two Democrats, Mark Roosevelt and Tom Birmingham, who wrote that law, now speak out for more? because it's clear that those schools are, again, particularly in Boston, are doing well. It's clear that the amount of change we hope for at all schools in the state has not happened. There's not a lot of logic to a cap on excellence and a cap on schools the parents want. There's not a lot of logic except for the disruption that it leads to for those who lose market share. And I said earlier, look, I get that. I'm, I'm spending time viscerally worrying about how we're gonna deal with 100 going to 300 kids out of you know, 4,400 middle uh -huh. schools. That's, that's a problem, it's a challenge. But the solution is not to keep the kids under padlock of a different sort and say, you can't leave if your parents think that school's better. The solution is be make our schools better. And so that's you don't why think I'm here it, to hijack this So if this you had your brothers, just so law. I understand, 12 is not really enough, is it? I mean, if it turns out, I understand that's what's on the ballot. I know Jessica didn't want to answer a hypothetical. I'll try you with a hypothetical. Would you, would Massachusetts be better off as far, as far as you're concerned if we were New Orleans, if we had not a 50% of our schools were charter schools, would that be a good thing? I don't think it's about the percentage. First of all, would super a matters, much larger share well, of It super matters how, how quality they are, Jim. So What's I think that? it super matters how high quality they are or aren't. And I agree with you, the quality definition is broader than just test scores. I do agree, although I think if you can't read a few paragraphs and answer questions on it, you got a lot of problems in life, but it's not just about, yeah, it's an and. We both totally agree on that. So I think that Massachusetts, one of the reasons also the cap is less of an issue is we have demonstrated so far the regulatory skill, unlike those other places like Detroit, to keep out, by and large, poor schools, to close 18 out of 
you know, of these charters have been closed, right? So, so far, as a state, we've been judicious. I don't think you can grow this sector super fast. A friend of mine and I were earlier today talking about even the charter's small expansion in the past, modest expansion in the past, has been a challenge for them. So, you know, you want to do this thing carefully. I don't think districts can absorb 100 change schools overnight, but the cap itself just doesn't logically make sense to I'm me. I'm going to have one final does. question for everybody in a minute, but we have about two minutes before that comes. Is there anything that is causing any of your foreheads to pop off that you haven't? Yeah. You can have 30 seconds to address any of you something that you feel needs more filling in for the people here. So I, I do, I want to say that students are not market shares. And the question was called to question by the yes on two side, and they did not have a ballot question that would provide public funds for all public schools. This question is going to give maybe some more, but at the expense of everybody else. And that's what's at the heart of this issue. And if we really were about all st public funds for all students, then why didn't your side come up with a ballot question that would actually provide public funding for all public schools in the state? Marty, you want to address that? Um, Quickly, please. Th there, is, there, is, there are billions of dollars available for public schools in this state, and charter schools are funded by the state. So we're, we keep coming and talking as if somehow we're pitting kids against each other. We're actually trying to educate all children. But I want to come back to something Quickly. that is about the suspension issue. I think as a society, there is work to be done in all of our schools about suspension rates. But again, let's look at the data on charter schools. You look at the suspension rate data, but then you look at the attrition data. What percentage of kids are actually leaving by the end of the school year? Attrition is lower in the urban charters than it is in the district schools. You look at the high school dropout rate. The high school dropout rate is lower in charters than it is in district schools. So when you look at the school as a whole, students are staying and thriving. That doesn't mean there's no work to be done on suspension in the cultural issues that as a society we have in our districts and our charters. But let's not make it sound like the kids are fleeing charters, they're staying, and there's 30,000 kids on wait list trying to get in because parents want them. You feel the need? It's fine. If you want to quickly yeah, respond. Yeah, just a, a quick one. Maybe it's not a, a direct response because I still think it's an issue at charter schools and the, and the data has shown that. I think, you know, it's interesting because the motive appeal, it seems to be from the yes on two side, is those parents who want the option. Again, I support a parent's choice to figure out whatever works for their child. But if we pack this room with parents who are worried about quality education, they're not thinking about charters. They're thinking about the public school options they have and that they should work for their children. And the reality is, why don't we invest that much time, that much energy, that much money in making that work for where most of our kids are? To me, I tell my community, when I speak and advocate on behalf of communities, because I say, this is, this is chess, not checkers. The reality is, is, why did all these folks come from that all of a sudden care about black and brown children? That quite frankly, they wouldn't answer our call on the many other issues we had, but all of a sudden, so to me, the chestnut checkers part of this is this is not just about providing quality education for black and brown children. There's an end game to this about public money being used to educate people in other communities. That is a general consensus in communities of color that there's a concern. This is not just about our kids. Okay, I have a final thought. One or two of you mentioned that, uh, that ballot questions were a blunt instrument. And by the way, I used to do them for a living, so I engaged in blunt instruments, but messages are sent here. I wanna start with you and Marty, and then I have a question for you too. Uh, Charlie Baker was, uh, Governor Baker was on our radio show a month, well, last week, but a month before, and Marjorie Egan uh, asked him a question about whether or not he was worried about the message that might be sent, because the governor is a deep believer, as am I, in direct democracy, I meaning he really likes this kind of thing. And here's what he said, this is verbatim. If the people in Massachusetts vote against this, meaning question two, they're making a statement about charter schools and about expansion, and that means we live with the status quo. Is Charlie Baker right? As much as it may pain you, if people say no to this question, as Governor Baker said, have they made a statement about charter schools? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I agree with the governor on that. I, it pains me that in a time of division on everything, people I respect who work at those schools charter schools, are, are, and some of their backers in particular, are pitted against people who also work 
whether it's NAACP, who was so critical to keeping accountability, for example, in ESSA when that was going to get gutted, right? Um, or whether it's the teachers union who are our partners in Springfield, who've been my partners in work in, in Massachusetts, uh, partners nationally. And I do think it's very unfortunate that supporters on both sides are so, I liked your point about, they're so overpainting the negativity. You would think either that every person wear, has horns in a charter or every person has horns if they work for NAACP or for the Boston Teachers Union or anyone else. I do feel personally that it's urgent we move Got faster it. and better for kids, including meeting the foundation budget. Couldn't agree with you do more. You, Marty, do you agree with Governor Baker and Chris Gabrielli? Well, there was another part of Governor Baker's comments that you left out, mm -hmm. which is that we might also look at the families in cities that voted yes, because they're speaking out. So we need to look at how people vote. Yes, we need to look at the statewide vote, but also let's listen to how people in Boston vote in Lawrence or wherever else. Again, my theme always is... Do you think is, he was suggesting in what he said on the show that if people voted no, but people in Boston wanted it, that I if think, a bill was filed to expand them in Boston? I, I think what the governor is suggesting and what we all ought to do is, one, work to get this ballot question passed. No, so, but that's not my question. And, so, and then secondly, that we need to listen to parents. They're telling okay. us something if we want to listen. Well, I want to ask the flip side very quickly of the two of you. Uh, I would argue that if though people believe that there's a broader statement made if people vote no, would you not acknowledge there's a broader statement uh, being made if people vote yes? Meaning that they're not just saying they want the cap lifted up to 12, but that they're saying we think charter schools are an important companion piece and we want the legislature to keep looking at this in a positive way. Would you agree with that? Uh, um, having worked on ballot questions, I know it doesn't come down to that. It comes down to who spends the most money who runs the most ads, who touches you the most with the mailing. And I've worked on several ballot questions that if people knew more of the details, they might vote differently. So, so you're really saying like somebody else that you won't accept the result? Is that what you're saying? I, I mean, I'm serious. Ultimately, this comes down to, to who has the more effective advocacy campaign. And that's what this decision will be made on. I think that there was a failure on the part of people who understand that this is complicated. The funding issues don't make sense to most voters and that this should have played out in the legislative process. And that shame on us if we let this play out in the ballot question. Well, fair enough. How about you, Jessica, to end this? If people vote no, uh, vote yes, I'm sorry, are they not making a broader statement than just this ballot question? I don't think so. And the reason why is because I've had the opportunity to talk to so many voters over the last few months. And when people get the facts of both sides, they overwhelmingly come over to the no on two side because the facts are just there. The way the current system is set up, Expanding 12 new Commonwealth charter schools in this state will come at the expense of the district public schools, and it will hurt the 96% of students who are in district public schools across the state. And what I do think it would mean, though, is that there is a need for more quality public schools. And we are all in to try to improve quality public schools. And right now, if people think that charter schools are better, I don't really think it's that they want more charter schools. It's about mm -hmm. having a quality public school, period. And we are all in and trying it. to make sure that we have more quality public schools for all students in this state. Now, in light of the fact that you had the last word, what would be an appropriate thing for the four of you to do at this particular point, would you say? <laughs> what, would you, what might you do? You'd go like this. Jessica, thank you very much for being here. Let's hear for Jessica Tang, Chris Gabrielli, Michael Curry, Marty Wolf. I want to thank you all for coming from the Kennedy Institute, from WGBH, and I have to say the, 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 the service that this place provides for the public on so many fronts, both with debates like this, with speakers of great prominence and soul, is unparalleled in this community. So I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled that you were here. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on November 8th. Thanks, you guys. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to see you.